congratulations on this honor and for the tireless work and outstanding inspiration that brings you to this stage tonight. Kerry, can you come up to receive the award? to be back in Atlanta. First of all, Shirley Franklin, who is so amazing, but I thought you were my friend. <laughs> and then you make me go after Vernon Jordan, I mean, in Atlanta. How could you do that? Doug Shipman is, has just really been so extraordinary in leading this effort. Yeah. Like, can we get Doug Shipman? I also want to say thank you to Deborah Richardson, um, to George Howell, to Alex Cummings. I'm so honored to receive this award, um, and I accept it on behalf of my colleagues, people who face imprisonment and torture and death every day for basic rights, which we're lucky enough to take for granted. And I'm especially inspired to share the stage tonight with such a brave and generous group of people, someone I've known my whole life, Vernon Jordan, Estella Barnes de Carlotta, who I met marching in Argentina um, a decade ago, and Ada Lee and Pete Carell. I also want to say that I can't believe I'm on the stage getting an award in a room that's C.T. Vivian is in. Why? You should be up here. You're such a hero to all of us. Thank you. I was so very moved to be able to see the Center for Civil uh, and Human Rights earlier today. When I, I was on the, the board at the, in the first few years of the, uh, of the, um, uh, of the Center, and there was, a, there was a big debate. It was really an incredible, incredible um, experience because I was with all of these historians, mostly from the civil rights era. And so there was a lot of debate about where we should start and some argued for the modern civil rights movement and its Atlanta roots. And then others said, no, we should begin with the Magna Carta because that's really the the, the center of, of human rights. Uh, and then others argued for the ancient Egyptian pyramids, which were built by slaves in uh, 2560 BC, in which someone scrawled the graffiti, which continues to haunt and inspire the human rights movement today. And it reads, no one was angry enough to speak out. 4,550 years later, speaking out is what this center is all about. People sometimes ask me why I became interested in human rights, and I have uh, three sisters and seven brothers, and that gives you an appreciation for human rights <laughs> at a very young age. Um, my earliest memories are when my father was the attorney general at the height of the civil rights movement, and my mother, we used to go and visit him at the Justice Department. My mother would take six or seven of the kids and a couple of dogs and a football and uh, put us in the back of her convertible and drive down to the Justice Department. We'd run around and see my father, but we really loved to go into the basement of the Justice Department. There's a tunnel over to the FBI building, and we would watch the sharpshooters at practice. The head of the FBI at that time was J. Edgar Hoover, who was a man not known for his sense of humor or love of children. <laughs> and he said at the time that um, the three biggest threats to security in the United States are somebody who used to work for him and he didn't get along with, uh, Martin Luther King and Robert F. Kennedy. And you know, my father was his boss at the time. And so anyway, the strange part about this story is that in the bottom of the FBI building was a suggestion box. I, who's, I, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> anyway, 
Anyway, so my mother, you know, saw that and she took out her telltale red pen and wrote a suggestion, put it in the box. And then uh, she was gathering up all the kids and the dogs and the football, which took her a few minutes. And bringing us back to daddy's office, a very astute FBI agent went and took the suggestion out of the box and ran it up to J. Edgar Hoover, who immediately had it sent over to daddy. And so when we were walking into his office, he was reading the suggestion. And it said, get a new director. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so uh, you know, it was, an, it was an early lesson, the importance of speaking truth to power. Um, so one day when I went to visit my father, he wrote me a letter. And I have that letter on my wall. And it says, uh, dear Carrie, today was a historic day not just because of your visit, but because two African-Americans over the objections of the governor were allowed to register at the university. Um, I hope these events are long past by the time you get your pretty little head to college. Love and kisses, daddy. So walking through that museum today reminds us that those events are indeed long past, and yet, for too many in our country, the vision of a just America that the civil rights activists fought for remains a dream deferred. So today, just as the ancient Egyptians said we must be angry enough to speak out, today we must be angry enough to speak out when we see that the wealth of the top 1% of Americans is equal to the wealth of the bottom 90%. We have to be angry enough to speak out when the wealth of white households is 13 times the median wealth of African American households. We need to be angry enough to speak out when African American students are expelled at three times the rate of white students. When police unlawfully arrest an innocent man, throw him, in the back of a van and take him on a terrifying, brutal journey which he does not survive. And the practice is so common that they have a name for it, a rough ride. We have to be angry enough to speak out when African Americans are jailed for drug offenses at six times the rates of whites, even though five times as many whites use drugs. And we should be angry enough to speak out when the Supreme Court cripples the Voting Rights Act on its 50th anniversary. We should, we should be angry enough to speak out because anger well-directed can be a force for revolutionary change. But righteous anger alone cannot realize our greatest ambitions for our country. We need more. To fulfill the dream, that Martin Luther King Jr. glimpsed from that mountaintop, the dream of an America that lives up to its highest ideals for peace and harmony and equality. We must harness not only our righteous anger, but our love, because we will not be satisfied merely with a world that is just. We strive for a world of compassion and peace and respect for each other a world where every person is celebrated as a child of God. And that world cannot be built on anger alone. That world can only be built on love. So I want to thank all of you for supporting the Center for Civil and Human Rights and for believing in justice and in love. And I'd like to end with these lines from Langston Hughes. He said, oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet and yet must be, the land where everyone is free, the poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me, who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain must bring back our mighty dream again. We, the people, must redeem the mountains, the rivers, and the highest plain, all, all the stretch of these great green states, and make America, America again. 
So hold fast to your dreams, to your courage, and your commitment, and let's make America, America again. Thank you. Thank you.